Welcome everyone to the Lands, People and Economy panel during which we'll be talking about the power and potential for creating social change and addressing climate threats through workforce development and jobs. I can't wait to introduce our panelists to you, but before I do that, I'd like to share a land acknowledgement for this session. For thousands of years, the place we now call the Bay Area has been the home of the Ohlone, Miwok, Kashaya, Homo, Mishawapo, Amamutsen, and Papuans tribes and bands. We acknowledge that for 10,000 plus years, people have lived in harmony on these lands. We recognize the impact that the arrival and colonization by the Spanish and Americans have had on the lands and native peoples. And we honor the indigenous people living today as well as their ancestors and deeply respect their resilience and connection to the land. So our next session of speakers are gonna be talking about what an integrated approach to economic development and climate adaptation that focuses on the needs of vulnerable and marginalized communities can look like and how this approach has the potential to transform our region and begin to address the many crises we face today. Climate change, systemic racism and inequity, the pandemic and the associated economic downturn. When shelter in place orders first went into effect here in the Bay Area, our coalition members quickly realized that in order to continue providing essential services to their communities, such as vegetation management to prevent wildfires or managing public access to nature, or providing drinking water to communities, capital investment was critically needed. We also wanted to understand how many jobs are associated with our members' projects and programs. We watched as leaders in Congress passed the Great American Outdoors Act this summer and understood that many elected leaders who may not have been moved by the deferred maintenance needs of our national parks were in fact very moved by the significant number of restoration and stewardship jobs the funding would provide. Pew Research conducted a study that directly links the Great American Outdoors Act priorities with good paying restoration and stewardship jobs that support economic multiplier effects benefiting communities and nature. So what's the story in our region? Our Bay Area Green Stimulus Report released in May of this year found that with targeted investments focused on addressing the needs of climate vulnerable communities, our coalition could create and sustain more than 10,500 new jobs in the Bay Area alone. These are career pathway jobs that would address climate threats through green infrastructure projects, promote equitable access to the outdoors, which is needed more than ever in the context of COVID-19, and support our regional food systems and working lands, all while creating a pathway to economic recovery focused on the community's hardest hit by the current issues we face. Recently, Governor Newsom's Climate Action Day, we heard from speakers across the globe who agree, it's time to elevate the work of climate resilience, to invest at scale and let the science drive for lands and for people. Together Bay Area and many of our partners across the region are ready to push for this paradigm shift. As California burns and millions face unemployment, we simply cannot ignore the relevance of this integrated approach, prioritizing climate resilience and social equity. I'm excited to hear from our speakers about this. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you today, Antonio Alfaro of Valley Water, Keita Price of the Broward Dellums Institute for Sustainable Policy Studies, Karia Shabazz of Higher Ground, and Kellex Nelson of the San Mateo Resource Conservation, Conservation District. Welcome everyone and thanks for being here. I'm really excited to introduce all of you to our amazing uh, panelists. We have Kellex Nelson of the San Mateo County Resource Conservation District, Antonio Alfaro of Valley Water, Keita Price of the Broward Dellums Institute for Sustainable Policy Studies, and Karia Shabazz of Higher Ground. Welcome everybody. So great to have you here. Thank you. So today we're gonna to be talking about lands, people, and the economy, the Together Bay Area Green Jobs Report. What happened at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated economic downturn, our coalition wanted to understand the contributions that our projects and programs make to a regional economy and the statewide jobs market. And we also started to see how the threats of climate change and the impacts of the pandemic were disproportionately impacting vulnerable communities and under-resourced communities. And knowing that capital investment was needed, is needed today to address climate threats against those vulnerable communities, we wanted to understand what contributions we could make to the regional economy. And so we surveyed our members to understand um, 
how many jobs they could create. And we found an incredible statistic. Our 64 members in a conservative basis can create 10,500 new jobs with capital investment in green infrastructure projects, public access projects, and stewardship projects across the region. Now we know that state decision makers don't necessarily think about conservation and stewardship as a source of economic growth or even a pathway to economic recovery. And so it was really important that we start to ask ourselves the questions about what's possible in terms of community-led stewardship, public agencies working to make lands accessible and the agricultural economy as well, where food systems are supported and how those, how those activities and those projects and programs support jobs. So I'm really pleased to talk with all of you today about the jobs that are associated with the programs and projects that you run. I'd love to start with you, Antonio, if you can share a little bit about the uh, public access and recreation projects that Valley Water is undertaking. Sure, thanks, Shalana. Um, thank you to my fellow panelists. Today, I'd like to discuss the natural components of Valley Water's infrastructure projects and then highlight the environmental and community benefits they provide while also creating thousands of job opportunities for the region. The Valley Water mission is to provide Silicon Valley with safe, clean water for a healthy life, environment, and economy. We do that by ensuring a clean and reliable water supply, providing flood protection in our communities, and acting as a steward of our environment. We serve 2 million residents, 15 cities, almost 5,000 groundwater well owners, 13 water retailers, we are a water wholesaler, sustainable groundwater management agency, flood protection agency, and a public agency steward of the environment. We are governed by a seven member elected board of directors who represent the interest of the people we serve. Much of what we do is financed by the Safe Clean Water Natural Flood Protection Program known, known as Safe Clean Water. The program funds upgrades to pipelines, dams, and critical water infrastructure to improve water supplies and prepare for the risk of flooding, droughts, earthquakes, natural disasters, and climate change. The program was last updated by the voters in 2012 and passed by almost 74% of the voters in Santa Clara County. An update to the Safe Clean Water Program is on the ballot this November and is known as Measure S. If the voters renew this property tax, it will allow Valley Water to continue to undertake many of the environmental efforts such as protecting fish and other species, managing vegetation, including the removal of invasive species, reducing toxins and other contaminants in our rivers, lakes, and streams through the pollution prevention and creek cleanup efforts, and providing grants to other entities to assist in these efforts. Overall, the funding would provide a portion of the cost of approximately 2 billion in local capital infrastructure projects over a 15 year period, that is estimated to create 40,000 jobs. Valley Water shares the public's concern about climate change. Our mission is challenged by increasing temperatures, changing precipitation and runoff patterns, an increased number and severity of droughts, reduced snowpack and rising sea levels. That is why we are advancing our county's resilience to climate change disruptions through specific actions, which include restoring water storage facilities, expanding water conservation, recycled water, continuing to work on the South San Francisco Bay shoreline project, improving our flood forecast and warning capabilities and developing multiple restoration and enhancement projects. I'm going to provide four examples of projects that provide thousands of job opportunities while addressing our water supply, flood protection mission, but also include recreation and natural elements. The Shoreline Project incorporates a multi-benefit approach to flood protection by combining environmental restoration of wetlands and traditional levee construction to protect communities in the South San Francisco Bay Area. The first phase of the project is now underway. It will construct a new four mile levee along the South San Francisco Bay, restore approximately 2,900 acres of former salt ponds to tidal marsh habitat and provide public wildlife oriented recreation. The project will also complete missing segments of the San Francisco Bay Trail. Something to consider is that flood control projects often provide critical protection to low income and disadvantaged communities because housing is more affordable in areas that are subject to flooding. The Shoreline Project will protect El Viso, a community that has 
suffered flooding since it was constructed. The total design and construction cost for the first phase of the shoreline project is estimated to cost $177 million, creating over 1,770 good paying jobs for the region. The second project is the McKelvey Park Detention Basin. It is the perfect example of a project that provides multiple benefits by providing flood protection and creating opportunities for outdoor recreation. The McKelvey Park Detention Area is approximately four and a half acres in size and 18 feet deep. The parking lot is slow so that the street level is much higher than the bottom of the field. Flood flows would inundate the site very rarely and quickly drain away. The 100 year flood, which has a 100% chance of occurring in any given year, would fill the detention area and drain out in about one to four days. Post cleanup would only take two to four weeks and then the playing fields would be ready to use once again. The project provides flood protection for thousands of homes and businesses in Mountain View and Los Altos, saving residents thousands of dollars in flood insurance each year, while also providing new recreational opportunities for park users. The cost to complete the project was $84 million, creating over 840 jobs. Next, the Pacheco Reservoir is located 60 miles southeast of San Jose and sits north of Highway 152 along the North Folk fork of the Pacheco project. The expanded reservoir project includes the construction of an earthen dam made of rock and soil upstream of an existing dam. The expanded reservoir would be filled by rainfall and also imported water from San Luis Reservoir. It is situated outside of Henry Coe Park and may provide an opportunity for water rec recreation near the park. The existing reservoir is small compared to the expansion. It currently holds enough water for 55,000 people for one year. After the expansion, it will hold enough water for 1.4 million people for a year. The new expanded reservoir will create a cold water pool, cooling down the flows that run into Pacheco Creek towards the Pajaro River, thereby creating new habitat for federally threatened steelhead trout. While the main purpose of the project is to store emergency water for Santa Clara County, it also provides immense public benefits. That is why the Pacheco project was the highest scoring project under the Proposition 1 Water Storage Investment Program, which will provide $485 million towards the project's completion. The newly improved reservoir would also provide improved flood protection for the downstream communities of Pajaro and Watsonville, which would have a long history of flooding. The Pacheco Reservoir is estimated to cost $1.3 billion and would create over 13,000 jobs. Finally, Valley Water is replacing the Anderson Dam in Morgan Hill so it can safely withstand a large earthquake. Known as the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project, this effort will ensure public safety, restore regional water supply reliability, and include numerous downstream environmental enhancements. A large earthquake on the Calaveras Fault or the Coyote Creek Fault could result in significant damage to Anderson Dam, possibly leading to dam failure and an uncontrolled release of water that could inundate the cities and rural areas in the South Bay to Monterey Bay, including much of Silicon Valley. Anderson Dam is critical to the water supply reliability of Santa Clara County. It is bigger than all other nine reservoirs that we currently own. Without the water supply collected from this watershed, Santa Clara County is more dependent on imported water supplies from the Delta. Once completed, the Anderson Dam will be able to again provide a cold water pool for several fish species, including federally threatened steelhead. In addition, the completed project will allow for the reservoir, reservoir to be filled to capacity and continue to provide recreational opportunities for the region. The project is expected to cost $576 million creating over 5,400 jobs. As you can see, infrastructure projects carried out by Valley Water provide multiple benefits, including water supply, flood protection, recreation, and environmental habitat, while also creating thousands of jobs. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Antonio. I'm really struck by the size and scope of these green infrastructure projects. And as you've really clearly articulated, there are so many benefits that come from these types of projects. Um, and, and the fact that we can address some of 
begin to address um, some of the layered crises that we are facing as a region right now. One, we have so many communities who are out of work. Millions of people across the country have lost their jobs. The jobs that you're talking about are career track, good paying jobs. In addition, you mentioned um, that many of these projects would address uh, climate threats that are impacting communities and water supply as well as habitat. Mm -hmm. So really see so much potential there. Can you talk a little bit about Valley Water's community process and how, how you work with communities to help design some of these projects so that they do have a community input and benefit? Yeah, anytime our uh, publicly elected board considers a new project, we go through a rigorous process of gaining um, the community's input. So we make multiple changes along the way and we work with our regulators to make changes to, you know, to the impacts of the project so that we can, in some, in most cases, enhance the environment or, um, you know, change the way that these projects are operated because they've been in place for 50, 70, you know, uh, 90 years in some cases, where um, back then they didn't think about the impacts to the, to the environment as much, right? And so, our community has grown around these projects being in place and, and in a lot of cases, especially on the water supply side of, of our district, um, the community relies on that, on, on them being there. You know, those reservoirs provide water for millions of people, um, but they have impacts. And so whenever we are undertaking new, a new project, especially these projects, you know, in a large scope and size, um, we go out to the community, we get multiple points of reference and, and input. Um, also for like, for the financing for this uh, Safe Clean Water program, we've had thousands of community uh, uh, point of touch where we have gotten input uh, based on where the community thinks the funding should be going towards. We, we made multiple changes along the way. And we think that, you know, the funding reflects the priorities of the community and the priorities of our board it includes $155 million over the next 15 years for environmental um, type of uh, projects, um, programs that provide funding for creek cleanups, um, they provide grants to other organizations to do, uh, you know, uh, projects that may address um, climate change or environmental impacts, um, you know, so I think in general, we go out to the community, we get the input, and then we make the changes that are necessary. That's really great. And I really appreciate kind of how you're explaining that the community in a way directs some of these large uh, capital fund sources so that the projects are designed to meet their own needs. And Valley Water, of course, is working in highly built, densely urban area, seismically active, um, and the stewards of, as you said, water resources for millions of people. Um, so that community connection is, is, is so important to make sure that your projects are a success. Thank you, Antonio. So I'd like to dig a little deeper into this idea of community-led stewardship projects that address multiple, multiple needs within a community, whether it's climate change, creating jobs, and, and making our neighborhoods more livable. Kita, welcome. So happy to have you here. I'm hoping you can share a little bit with us about a community-led stewardship project that you're working on right here in Oakland. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I would like to talk about the Sally Andro um, or Lijon Creek Greenway Trail and some community stewardship opportunities um, associated to that um, in East Oakland. Again, I'm Peter Price, also known as a hood planner. And I'm, today I'm representing the, the, the David Brower, um, sorry, the Brower Dellums Institute for Sustainable Policy Studies and Action. And so this, the Institute is basically a group of planners and individuals that kind of, um, provide advisory and um, support to communities such as East Oakland to push climate projects, you know, that, that's, that benefit the community. And most of them are stewardship opportunities, um, such as the San Leandro Creek Greenway um, that I would like to share. And so on the next slide, um, you see here is the San Leandro Creek, Lejean Creek. Um, if you're not familiar with East Oakland, um, in the back, in the hoods of to Brandy Park and Columbia Gardens and Brookfield um, Village, there is actually um, a surface creek, again, called the Sally Andro Lejean Creek. Um, and it's, it's been no public access, 
I don't I want to say forever um, people have always used it but I, I don't know if it's ever been, really been like open intentionally to community um, and so the Broward Dellums Institute um, higher ground um, the, Re the resident council of Sabrani Park planning justice um, we are all partners um, on a 4.1 and the flood district on a flood point one um, million dollar construction grant to construct a, a bike and pedestrian trail along the Sally Angel Creek <clears throat> to create access from the um, from the community of DP Stokeland all the way to the Martin Luther King Jr. shoreline. Right now, the only access points to the shoreline are very um, toxic, is full of industrial. Um, the routes are along industrial pathways, um, you know, where the AB and I boundary is and um, things like that. Or if you don't have transportation, it's just, you know, trying to get across a lot of the BART, the train and things like that. So um, this project was um, not, not only meant to create access to the shoreline, but to also create opportunities um, for employment within the neighborhood <clears throat> and create a place where you and the community can, can go again for uh, more green space. And um, as I mentioned, one of our partners is Planning Justice. So right next door to the creek is a two acre nursery that the Planning Justice has in DP Stokeland, also joined by Segorte Land Trust, um, where they are, yes, going to actually take over the nursery. Planning Justice, Planning Justice is giving the nursery over to Segorte Land Trust, you know, um, honoring the land and, and the Ohlone Huchin people that came here before. Um, and yeah. So uh, next slide is just about kind of community engagement and outreach. We've done a lot of community engagement and outreach that kind of um, echo the fact that that honoring the land is very important, not just uh, stewarding the land uh, for economic potential healing and development of the community um, to bring back cultural, um, you know, uh, to bring back yeah cultural activities that we all we all have um, indigenous, black, um, Latinx folks alike. Um, so that's really um, a big part of our design. So a lot of our community engagement and design have. Um, being with the local um, neighbors, um, with, with the, we have partnered with the Black Culture Zone because we recognize community fatigue um, with community engagement. So we try to streamline project efforts to avoid that en engagement fatigue. So again, we partnered with the Black Culture Zone and the partners that I mentioned before to make sure that um, we're covering different areas of the community um, to hear what they want. Um, and, and as I mentioned, community stewardship is um, definitely something that um, folks want. So on the next slide, um, you see just more pictures here of the beautiful creek. Um, and yeah, it's 1.2 miles from the neighborhoods all the way to the shoreline. So um, it's a lot of opportunity to, to keep it up, to um, you know, maintain certain safety in a way that's actually uh, you know, cooperative and comfortable with the community and not the traditional like policing and um, sucking up of jobs by the local agencies. And so that's kind of where we are with the project. Uh, we've made a lot of headway in just getting the 4.1 million to construct it and open it to the public. Yet our current, um, our dilemma have always been that the flood district will only open, actually open the creek, whether it's constructed or not, they will only open it to the public if um, an entity that has a policing agency um, tied to it was to be the, the maintenance and operator of the creek. And so since we haven't wanted that to happen, we've kind of been like, stifled in the project. And so now we're kind of at the point where we have to work with the agencies to, um, we want the creek open. So we actually secured a grant through the Transformative Climate Communities um, Award, 28.2 million to some projects in East Oakland. And so, and that included the Saliento Creek project for the East Bay Regional Park District to be the maintenance and operators of the land, like 2 million to operate just a portion of that creek. And so just imagine how many uh, people that could have employed at, to the community opposed to three positions to East Bay Regional Park District. And so we have to still work through those kind of, you know, complexities. And um, that's kind of where we're at moving forward. And next, just want to, um, Kyria from Higher Ground is going to talk to you all just about some existing green job opportunities and um, that, that's going on in the hood right now. With the youth. Well, uh, thank you very much, Kita, um, for that handoff. Again, my name is Kyria Shabazz. I am representing Higher Ground Neighborhood Development Corporation. Um, and just what the title is, that's what we that's what we represent. That's what we do. We develop neighborhoods. Um, so just like Kita was sharing, we had a um, we also have a few 
um, projects that um, promote stewardship. And when the folks need the youth, higher ground is who they call. So um, a lot of folks that they're, they're able to get our resident leaders in and, 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 and get a lot of opinions from the adults that might be at these meetings, but higher ground is always in charge of making sure youth voices are heard in this entire planning process. We literally will go to their classes, give them presentations and ensure that they are sitting at the tables. When you see me at a meeting, you'll see my youth at the meeting as well to make sure that their input and their voices are heard to ensure this is their community. <laughs> this is, it's, it's their generation. Um, so pertaining to the San Leandro Creek project, we actually were able to get our stewardship um, uh, kicked off this past summer. Um, Higher Ground alone um, hired about six youth that combined with Madison Park Academy were able to hire about 10 youth to all combine and do research and do research and find out exactly what are the activities that your community members want to see um, on this trail? Um, what are the uses? How do you feel that this should be policed? How do you feel like that this should be maintained? We also had them encourage them to find local artists, all right, that can contribute to the uh, the culture aspect of what this San Leandro Creek will look like. So they literally went out and researched um, black and brown and local construction companies, as well as artists, um, to ensure that everyone hands are able to touch this project and that um, the folks that it's serving are the people that it's actually living in these neighborhoods. So that that's definitely key. Um, another huge part of what the youth were able to contribute to this project is that they designed their own outdoor classroom. This outdoor classroom will be sitting um, in right in the San Leandro Creek um, right in back of Madison Park Academy. This will be a STEM lab. This is where teachers will come and do their STEM lessons. And they talk about restoration. They talk about air quality. They talk about plant identification. These are the things that they're actually gonna be put in these green spaces to discuss. Our youth don't get that, all right? We're in deep East Oakland and the, the, where the redwoods grow and our youth still do not have access to these things. So this is where we come in. Um, our youth were all paid this past summer. These are actual jobs that they had. Um, and it's teaching them so many different skills, uh, skills that lend them in careers that involve climate change and neighborhood development. Um, another huge part, uh, we're talking about Sobrani Park now. I'm gonna walk you about down about five minutes to Brookfield um, Elementary. And that's where we were able to build a Brook the Brookfield Greening Project, all right? So we were able to literally dig up the concrete at Brookfield Elementary and plant over 75 trees amongst this land so our children can just do the basics, which is breathe, right? Breathe. So, so yeah, so we were able to do that. Um, we are able to continue to maintain it. We actually hired this summer um, and it was the perfect, um, perfect job since this pandemic hit. Um, we were all able to follow all CDC guidelines, but our youth were able to come in and help maintain this. We're talking about watering, de-reading, planting, ensuring um, our butterfly garden, ensuring that our plants are still there and healthy and maintained as we uh, continue to go along, okay? So that that's a huge part. Another part of these greenways is that our teachers are able to come outside their classrooms and actually conduct STEM lessons within these greenways, okay? So that was, it, it was huge that um, our students are able to come um, get employed to do this work, um, get employed to give their ideas um, in, in it's in, in, and they're here, they, they get to enjoy it. Um, they get to discuss it, they get to talk about it. Um, we hold workshops where they are able to discuss these issues and get their um, ideas out on paper. Um, so our Brookfield Greening Project, that's, 
that's something that's gonna that's ongoing. How do we do this? Our partners, our partners are everything. So just like um, Kita was uh, mentioning, we're a part of a huge coalition called the IONI, uh, which is made of 14 different organizations that's paving the way for this, for this work. We're a part of um, Roots Community Health Center. Um, they're huge. The Bay Area Air District, the city of Oakland, Bay Area Regional Parks, um, and, and other folks who are just now the Black Culture Zone, other folks that are now coming in. So our partners are everything, okay? So <laughs> rooted in deep East Oakland. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Karia and Kita. There's so much inspiration in what you just shared about these projects. I'm, I'm hearing you talk about this collaboration and your partnerships doing a lot of work. You're talking about dismantling systemic racism and pol the police state in the East Bay. You're talking about cultural awareness and celebration. You're talking about stewardship projects that add to the biodiversity and health of our region and of our city and our town. You're talking about connecting community members to their lands, to the shoreline and increasing livability. This is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. And I, I wanna ask both of you a couple of questions and either one of you that feels like responding, please, please jump in. But Kita, you mentioned at the beginning that this project, the Liz John Creek project was specifically put together with an eye to create jobs, to bring community members into the process and create long-term stewardship based jobs for folks. Can you talk a little bit about um, what the community was saying that they want in terms of jobs and long-term employment? What were the needs that they were describing for themselves in relationship to this project and the job opportunities? So honestly, um, that early engagement was done probably about 18 years ago, but it was still done within the area in preview of uh, Madison Park Academy. So it was it was just another wave of students that uh, and youth that was saying, you know, they see their future in you know, right. high school. So, you know, jobs and summertime, you know, it's not a lot to do and other so it is other stuff to get into, but you don't want them to get into that. So um, so yes, it's really been coming from the youth predominantly because honestly, uh, a lot of the adult neighbors are supportive of it. And as we get the word out more, there's other opportunities to um, building the benches, um, like doing actual carpentry and building uh, of the, um, the benches and, and things like that. Um, but the, the adults are for it, but the youth are really the one that's been pushing the jobs and the adults has been pushing jobs for the youth. Um, and a lot of adults that's around in the area are kind of still skeptical about opening the creek because more additional people now being exposed to the area or whatnot. So we're still kind of um, collaborating with those neighbors about that, but it's been a youth from day one that has really kind of led the conversation and got us to this point of the 4.1 million grant um, and to be able to move forward. And uh, yeah, again, higher ground was center and instrumental on in that. Well, congratulations both of you on that huge uh, transformative grant that's allowing this project to move forward. And I can hear 18 years is a lot of time for a community to be hoping, right? And planning and thinking, and we know what that's like. Um, so I really applaud both of your organizations for bringing this dream into a, a real a re a reality for the community. Um, Kyria, you talked a lot about educational opportunities that are going to come out of this project and together Bay Area members are really interested in what we've been describing as an integrated economic development and climate adaptation approach. Part of that means that we need to educate the public about the climate threats that are impacting us. All of us were stuck inside over the last few weeks uh, because of the smoke, right? So we know that you don't have to live in the wildland urban interface necessarily, right? In, in, to get uh, to be impacted by um, a, a catastrophic wildfire. Can you talk a little bit about how the youth or your partners have been prioritizing climate change as you develop these projects? Yes, so um, climate change has actually been the center of our latest projects and our um, actual latest camp. So like I said, during the pandemic, 
We all know everything was a little impossible, except we were still able to do our outdoor adventure camp. Um, we were able to host um, about 10 youth, um, employ about uh, five youth workers um, and two adults to um, actually conduct outdoor adventure camps. We were able to follow all CDC guidelines while still in, in exposing our youth to these green spaces, letting and they can actually see just because you live here doesn't mean that you won't be affected by what goes on up there. Um, so this was a camp that happened five days a week. Um, we took surveys and assessments from the parents from that camp and they came back and said a plethora of skills that their students learned. We were able to do STEM and art lessons. We were able to take these kids fishing. We we're able to build um, tools and further connect their culture with, with nature, um, driving all but 10 minutes away. Um, so we were, so that, that has been a huge focus on the education of what we're um, really spinning off. We want our students to be service minded. We want them to be service minded youth. Then we know that they will turn into service minded adults, of course. Uh, we want them to get these jobs within um, climate change and know that it, it does fit you. It does fit right. you. This is the way you grew up. This is in your blood. This is, th these are the folks who we invented this. So um, it's just very important. And that's kind of where we are focused on um, as an organization amongst a lot of other things. Um, but that one's very huge. Yeah, it sounds really central. And I heard too, in what you were sharing about the project that, that you and Kita are collaborating on that the uh, students and the youth are doing water quality testing, they're looking at restoration of native grasses and things like that. I mean, what you're building is a community of our future stewards, right? Um, I can't think of anything more critical to do right now. Kita. I just wanted to make one as, or just, I forgot to mention one important thing about the project um, with all these great things that you just mentioned about the project is under threat um, by the Union Pacific Railroad, not have not valuing community and, you know, uh, sacred land by trying to reopen a passenger line that's going to now cross the creek. And so it would prohibit us from opening it. And we've been trying to have Union Pacific become a partner of the project for again, a decade now. And so now we see why they didn't want to because now they're trying to open this new line that will create 30 new trips a day, um, you know, in our neighborhood that will create more traffic, congestion, um, noise, and just, you know, pollution. And so, yeah, we, we I just want to call out to any help, you know, <laughs> around, uh, yeah, moving Union Pacific Railroads to be better partners around the Sally Act, John Creek. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I think, you know, what that illustrates is that here in the Bay Area, we don't get to do these uh, restoration, stewardship, uh, climate focused projects without thinking about the nexus on transportation and housing, right? Like these are really complicated issues and they're all interwoven together in our, in our nine or 10 county region, depending on if you count Santa Cruz, right? Um, so if y'all are comfortable, I'm going to open it up for a little bit of discussion and just ask a few questions and, and folks can just jump in where you feel so moved. How does that sound? Well, one of the things, as I mentioned, that Together Bay Area is 64 members, and that includes public agencies, indigenous tribes, and nonprofits in the region really wanted to investigate is if we were to get capital investment from the state or be able to leverage federal funding could we really put communities back to work while we solve the problems of climate change? And what I'm hearing in what Valley Water is sharing and what the Institute and Higher Ground is sharing is that the jobs are there. Not only are the jobs there, but people are hungry for these jobs. They want an entryway into stewardship and conservation focused jobs to make their own lives better, but also to contribute to their communities. So I'm wondering if you can share uh, with our listeners a little bit more about how um, you work with communities to design projects so that they do create jobs. Can you share a little bit more about, um, about that process of connecting community employment opportunities with the specific projects that you're looking at? What drives first, right? Like, are you looking at jobs? Are you looking at a specific community outcome and the jobs are there? Can you share a little bit more about that nexus between jobs and these projects? And feel free, any one of you, if you want to jump in on that one. 
Well, um, you know, maybe I'll jump in and, and just start by saying that, you know, when we look at financing, so, you know, this like safe, clean water, uh, it's a property tax measure. We're looking to secure the employment of not only the employees of the agency, you know, for the long term, um, but also just when we're, we know that when we're, we're creating jobs, um, uh, there's always community support um, from those entities that are employment related, you know, like unions, for example, because the jobs that we're creating, they're um, sustainable, they're career uh, positions, they're um, positions that uh, are, you know, planting trees as well, you know, that are doing conservancy work or, uh, you know, the operations and maintenance of creeks, it takes people to go into the creeks, clean up debris, um, clean up, you know, uh, trash, um, you know, uh, and make sure that the water quality of the area uh, remains uh, safe and that, you know, there's not a, a huge amount of runoff of litter into, into the bay. Um, so, you know, we're looking at climate change impacts, uh, a, a large, uh, I mean, a whole host of issues from just water supply in terms of the way that we're getting precipitation, not in the term of snow anymore. You know, I mean, we get, it's less and less over time. So we're getting more into like these um, pineapple express type of storms where a huge, huge amount of, of, of rain runoff. Well, we got to change our system. We got to, we have to make adjustments to the way that we collect and save water for for people. Um, and, and while we're looking at, you know, the overall picture of water supply, it's because of cl climate change. And because of that, we know that, um, you know, the work is going to allow for employment. And when we're going out and seeking funding from state or federal, you know, entities, you know, the, the state and federal governments, uh, we're looking to bring benefits to the region. You know, be it the Bay Area, Santa Clara County, you know, what have you. Thank you, Antonio. So yeah, I'm really hearing there that while you prioritize climate, climate change impacts in some of these project designs and, and for your agency in particular, water quality and supply, there is a real focus and emphasis on the jobs that can be created and that that in fact can support uh, you getting the capital funding you need to advance these projects. Yeah. Decision makers don't look to the types of projects that we're talking about as necessarily being the types of projects that carry a lot of jobs, right? Like when they think about the industry sectors that are gonna create a ton of jobs, they're thinking about public health, they're thinking about uh, education, they're thinking about the trades, and they don't typically look at conservation and stewardship projects, um, especially community-led conservation and stewardship projects as being a meaningful source of economic stability for communities. And what I'm hearing you share today is that that is in fact untrue. Um, and that when you go to a community and ask about what the needs are relative to climate change, relative to livability, um, that, that there is there are jobs there for, that are associated with some of these projects, right? Um, and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit in particular Korea and, and Kita in terms of the, the Liz John Creek project that you're working on. Um, how, how, how many different types of jobs are associated with that project? And are you looking at sort of volunteer based jobs as well as paid jobs and like the spectrum of the spectrum of um, available jobs that are that are associated with that project? So um, it's a it's the, the project is pretty layered. Um, so there's a, um, a lot of associated projects, but in terms of stewardship related um, in particular, um, yes. So maintaining, literally maintaining, like um, Antonio mentioned, you know, um, actually getting in, getting out of, you know, the creek, um, you know, when possible, as well as maintaining the bike and pedestrian trail. Um, but also just being ambassadors of the area, you know, instead of policing, but being ambassadors of the area that um, can help, yeah, maintain, you know, the environment and, and culture and atmosphere um, to be positive in a way. Um, yeah, and just help with kind of pro problem solving and things in the area. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, 
partners um, and they're actually planting the trees. So Planning Justice, as I mentioned, is a partner. And so they're um, the contracting partner to actually put in the trees um, along the creek because we have some bioswells and some trees, some green mm -hmm. infrastructure. It's a green infrastructure. So the installation is being done by the community through um, Planning Justice. And in case you don't know, some people don't know Planning Justice um, currently had um, provides a lot of jobs to the local community, black and brown community, um, and a lot of formerly incarcerated um, uh, individuals. And so um, they'll be kind of in lead of putting in the swells and the, the, the actual trees. And, but over long-term long -term maintenance, you know, we want to get that opportunity to, yeah, folks like um, the youth of higher ground and other yeah. people in the community. Yeah. And just piggybacking off of what Kita said is definitely later, layered. For instance, yeah. um, we're hired to uh, be hired to hire a whole group of folks um, to lay pavers down for the outdoor classroom. So um, it's definitely multiple layers. Um, and we're able to even hire folks within our organization to who live in these communities as well. Um, um, and like I said, our organization and, and the multiple organizations are actually respond, responsible for hiring for the work that has to be done. So it's all coming full circle on who gets these jobs, how many jobs, the access to these jobs, it's all coming full circle. Um, and it's all what we've heard in the multiple community um, meetings that we've facilitated um, as well as attended. Right, thank you, Korea. Oh, Kita, please go ahead. I just keep forgetting about water. Uh, keep talking about the creek and the trail, but the actual water. Um, the the institute, the Brown Adams Institute, also has some other contracts to supplement the 4.1 million to really engage the community around water quality. Some Prop One grants or whatnot. Mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah, talk about water quality and what that looks like. So um, again, out of that community engagement, a lot of demand for jobs, for quality, for water testing, and things like that um, has come up. So that's another again layer. Um, of the creek, you know, project and opportunities, along with a bunch of administrative, like somebody has to, yeah. you know, this has to operate. So that's along with a bunch of administrative opportunities and a whole bunch, um, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, listening to you, Kita and Korea, I mean, these, there are the extensive partnerships that you described. So all of those organizations are employing people who are working on this project. And then you have all the teachers who are coming into this new outdoor classroom, conducting STEM, STEM lessons, right? Um, so the sort of downstream jobs that are connected to projects like this, um, not only can be meaningful in the way that a large agency like Antonio's where, you know, he can create thousands of jobs with a project. These, these community led projects, um, they have a larger footprint than maybe what is, you know, right within the project budget with all of the jobs that are connected to them that bring people there, do environmental education, do the stewardship projects and the docent led tours and all of that work. Um, and it's, you know, it's really clear that those projects and the jobs associated with them can have a really transformational impact on the local community and neighborhoods. And, I, you know, I would like to just say that it's wonderful to hear that, you know, these um, community-based organizations are doing the work that lays, I think, the foundation for youth to be interested in jobs that are provided for, like, you know, from an agency like ours. We, we, we have all these jobs that um, are great. You know, they provide good, they're good paying jobs with great benefits that you don't necessarily, you know, we, yeah, we have the engineers and we have the scientists and we have PhDs and some of the most impressive people I've ever known work for our agency, but we have jobs also that don't require a degree. You know, you could, you could work and make a good living. You could get an associate's degree and you could go out and try to, you know, become a uh, drinking water treatment, you know, plant operator. Um, you you can work in in the in the maintenance of the creeks and make a great living. And you know, these are greens jobs that are going to be sustainable for the long term. And you know, working for a great agency. And just you know, when I was when I was a teenager, I wasn't aware of these jobs. And it looks you know these you know your community organizations, Kita, and and Korea are creating, you know, this interest. And I think it's just, it's just great. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. There's a mosaic of, of jobs that are available when projects like this get invested in. Yeah, 
Thank you, everybody. I'm really excited to introduce Kellex Nelson. She's the executive director of the San Mateo RCD Resource Conservation District. Kellex, thank you so much for being with us here today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So Kellex, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your organization, but also just set the stage for us? What is a resource conservation district and what's the role that an organization like that plays uh, in its community? Sure. RCDs are probably one of the best kept secrets in California. Uh, there's about a hundred of these special districts across California's landscapes. Um, and we serve basically as local hubs for conservation, working across land ownership types and uh, land values, um, not price values, but is this um, you know, uh, working land or conservation land or private residence? So working across public and private lands and helping people help the land using the best available science or resources and rooted in a deep abiding empathy and respect for the different ways that people engage with and need their lands. In San Mateo County, um, we serve like many of these other RCDs as a local hub for conservation and we um, work with um, you know, farmers, ranchers, greenhouses, nurseries, subdivisions, cities, municipalities, public agencies, land trusts, state parks, national parks, county parks, open space districts to try to accomplish um, natural resource stewardship at landscape scale, working across boundaries because so many of the issues that we're addressing, the needs we have, the threats that we're facing, they're not rooted in who owns the land. Right. Um, fire doesn't stop at a property boundary. An endangered species doesn't stop at a property boundary. So we're kind of working at um, property by property with a regional perspective or state perspective and at different scales. That's amazing. And what you're describing sounds incredibly complex. I mean, you're looking at an ecological system really holistically, not just for the resource values that are there, but community benefit. And also, as you said, the different types of, of landowners and, and land managers. There's a, a lot of diversity in there. Um, and, you know, what, what are some of the ways that your organization um, seeks to kind of grow those partnerships and also listen to these different um, landowners and understand what their different perspectives are. How do you how do you synthesize all of that when you're working on a particular project? And maybe you can give us a land based example of how those partnerships work in real time. Sure, I think one example um, is the work that we've been doing with many partners in the Pescadero watershed. Mm -hmm. This is a watershed on the south coast of San Mateo County and um, it's a priority for natural resource management for a number of reasons. It's it's listed as impaired by sediment under the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. It is one of the priority areas that has potential to recover populations of critically endangered coho salmon. It is home to more threatened and endangered species than I can count right now or bore you with. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, were, there are some really in, very immediate uh, community needs that are related to natural resource management. Um, one of the most obvious being the fires that just hit yeah. and um, people who lost everything in those fires, which are, um, you know, there's lots of issues around forest management and forest health. Um, the, the, what's going to happen after the fires with how debris moves and erosion, yeah. et cetera. Also um, aspects of watershed health and where sediment deposits has caused um, chronic flooding of basically yeah. the only access to the community in and out um, for decades, cutting them off from emergency response or getting to school or work, um, cutting their community off from economic um, development and economic um, opportunity. So in this watershed, we have really worked with a number of different partners to leverage our assets you know, some of these partners are, are able to bring in private capital. Some mm -hmm. of these partners are uh, public agencies that can contribute some types of resources, but not others. We've been able to access different types of funding sources to, um, to fill gaps or leverage this or that. 
And then working at a watershed scale, we've been able to invest, I think in recent years, uh, probably about 12 to $14 million in um, restoring a whole watershed top to bottom in a holistic integrated way, everything from carbon sequestration to um, fuel load reduction to erosion control to restoring um, the migration corridors of endangered fish and give them access to, at this point, over 70 miles of habitat they were previously unable to access for spawning, addressing community concerns around real risk and economic opportunity, and most importantly, helping people see that they didn't have to choose between concerns of the community and environmental protection, but actually there are some win-wins there. And also um, helping people see that government is there to help. They, this We've been able to create the conditions for people to see how state parks management of its land can be as a good neighbor can help them with their flooding and how a, a local special district, which is what we are, can meet community needs. All of this under the auspices of protecting or enhancing natural resources, being able to work in that sweet spot where there's the win for everybody. Yeah, I'm really interested in that in that sweet spot. And as you know, with the Together Bay Area jobs report that we released, we're looking really closely across the region, the nine county you know, nine counties that touch the bay and including Santa Cruz County um, at that sweet spot the integration of um, climate change action and economic opportunity. So I, I heard you mention that, you know, a lot of the projects that you work on are focused on how to improve economic uh, opportunities for community members, how to connect community members to the land and each other. Um, and then also you talked about, you know, egress and emergency service access. So there's like, there's just a panoply of issues that are, are, that are surrounding the types of projects that you do, even through the lens of habitat restoration and stewardship. Um, can you talk a little bit about that economic opportunity factor and how that touches down in your projects, Kellex? Because I can imagine, given their complexity, you're doing a lot of hiring too, or there's a potential for that. Yeah, we certainly have to. We have about um, 17 full-time equivalents on our staff, and then we work with probably hundreds of individual uh, partners through dozens of organizations, um, all of whom, these are jobs, you know, these aren't, this land management doesn't happen for free. Um, yeah. And, and in that equation also is working lands. Many of the properties that are essential to watershed health and the best management of our natural resources um, to address climate change and adapt to climate change and ensure food security and mm -hmm. fire resilience happens on private lands. You know, farmers, ranchers, greenhouses, residents, and um, and those are those are jobs that yeah. people who are doing them. And then there's all the people we contract with the the foresters, the arborists, the hydrologists, the geotechs, the people who install riparian exclusionary fencing to keep cows out of creeks um, or to put cross fencing on a ranch so that we can um, rotate cattle in a way that's regenerative for the land and sequesters carbon in the soils. Um, you know, these are all jobs. There are people who are doing the engineering, the designing, the planning, uh, the people who are um, have technical expertise in one or more aspects. Virtually every project has multiple um, experts on it, you know, because we're working in complex dynamic systems um, with complex dynamic um, implications. And so, um, so there's a lot of expertise that needs to be brought in. And then when you're working at that scale, um, even if it's property by property, but where you're looking at a watershed scale, that is a lot of people and a lot of work, a lot of products. And whether it's moving the dirt on the ground, you know, the equipment operators that are repairing old um, rural logging roads in these redwood forests to make sure that they have the mutual benefit of ensuring firefighting access and also reducing sediment that's going into salmon spawning habitat. Those are equipment operators. Right. There's a lot of them, you know, 
there are biologists that need to be monitoring to make sure that we're not doing more harm than good. There, um, there are engineers on that. So these things that it just looks like a dirt road in a forest. There was a whole host of expertise from the people who were the planners to the experts, the equipment operator experts, et cetera. Yeah, well, and I mean, I'm thinking about what Antonio shared earlier that, you know, at Valley Water, when you're looking at these large scale green infrastructure projects, um, a lot of the jobs associated with um, advancing those projects are at a variety of scales. So you have, you have jobs that are contractor jobs or um, full-time permanent staff uh, led jobs. Um, and that these can uh, survive the project window and, and continue um, project by project, and that there are a diversity of jobs out there for a, a number of different skill sets, um, which is a really interesting uh, dynamic to think about. And I'm, I'm thinking more about what you said, that there are hundreds of RCDs across the state. Um, and so when you start to play out what you just described for your organization in San Mateo County across the state, right. this is a ton of opportunity across a diversity of landscapes and landowners. Yeah, and the, and the multiplier effects of that. You know? right. So for example, um, one of our many valuable partners is the Amamutsin Tribal Band. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the Amamutsin is really interested in rebuilding the, some of the traditional practices um, of their tribe and reconnecting people who've been displaced with the land that they yeah. um, originally uh, populated. And so they're, they've developed um, a native stewards core. And, you know, we're able to contract with them, um, partner with state parks, bring um, tribal um, experts onto state parks property, all working together. State parks has some things they can offer to that. We have some things we can offer. And it's, it's workforce development for the tribal yeah. land. You know, they're sawyers, they're certified able to drop trees. They're becoming, you know, botanists, um, and it's also tied deeply to their cultural practice and um, and other aspects of community health, you know, something like that. Other yeah. projects where we're partnering with maybe, you know, a land trust um, like Peninsula Open Space Trust or others, and they're able to bring in private capital. You know, they have a donor base that is very supportive of their work, yeah. and so we they their investment can leverage us bringing in maybe bond dollars and that gets an investment from somebody else and somebody else and then we're able to do more work you know yeah. we're, we're really focused on not just dividing up the pie but everybody bringing a different ingredient and you can make a bigger pie and there's more people um, employed doing much more conservation at scale that's deeply relevant to the communities in which we work yeah, I really see that sort of network weaving that your organization and essentially the RCD um, model really provides across the state. And that is so compelling in terms of thinking about the need for capital investment in climate action that can drive economic recovery. Really so much uh, amazing potential in the model you're describing, Kellex. Thank you so much.